It is August the 7th, 2018, and we'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer, the option of rebound if necessary. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and this opportunity to be here as the royal family of God, assembled together to grow in grace and knowledge. We pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I had an article that I thought I downloaded to my stick, but I didn't, but I know what essentially what it said. I mean, it wasn't even an article, just a couple of paragraphs. Have you ever, any of you heard about the movie The Death of a Nation by Dinesh D'Souza? No. Anybody know if it's playing here in Brenham? Anybody know? Don't have a big bunch of moviegoers here, do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it is on, I would go see it. Uh, the article said that uh, the critics gave it a, a score of zero. Means it's good. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and those who were attending it gave it an 86% approval rating that uh, mm -hmm. would give it an A. So there's some kind of disconnect between the critics who are part of the media and the people who go and see the movie. So, uh, it, pardon? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he's from India. Yeah. Yes, he's the one that was pardoned. Yes. Yes. They they just he he had written. I mean, he had produced another movie about uh, Hillary, about Obama, and it wasn't very flattering, and they didn't like it. So he winds up going to jail for what nobody else would. So. Um, Anyway, he is uh, a very staunch conservative and a great filmmaker. I mean, it, it's, this isn't just a, a documentary. I guess it is a documentary, but the filming, everything about it is first class. I, I didn't, hadn't seen this one, but I saw a trailer of it, and I've seen the other movies that he does, and they're really good. So, no, that's what he said. He said the, the media is completely and entirely ignoring it as if it wasn't even, uh, like it didn't even exist. That's the way that they're handling it. So, yeah. That's only a senior citizen said, would say you, you'll call the movie house to see what's playing. Don't well, uh, young guys. people would never do that. They look at it on their cell phone. Yeah, I mean, they are on the line and everything. <laughs> but I'm, I'm laughing with, at myself as well, because that's what I think about calling. Mm -hmm. But they don't call anymore. So everything's online and all. Okay, let's get with our lesson. We already prayed, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I think we did. All right, I'll, give, I'll show you what we're going over. This was be less than 65. Now, is that big enough for everyone to see? Cindy, is it still in the parameters of your thing there? Uh, How about now? I didn't, I'm sorry, Mike. I had it's not cutting on. anything it's off, is it? No, no, no. Okay. I, I just forgot to turn on that little button, mm -hmm. but then you got to it. <laughs> okay, we're looking at our scripture. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, verse Verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, 
not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. And that's what we worked on last time about obedience and how important it is. Then we get to the, the part that for some people the wheels fall off. And that is the where it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So that's where we're going to start tonight. We touched on it a bit at the end of our lesson last Thursday. So we're just going to go with the, with the notes and then I'll be adding some things to it. So we're looking at the phrase, work out your salvation. This phrase is used in other scriptures using different words, but the meanings, the meaning, but meaning the same. Working out your salvation is the active pursuit of obedience in the process of being experientially sanctified. Now, this is something I added. When I went over this Thursday night, I didn't have that. That's what I do sometimes when I'm going to review from time to time, go back a few pages or half a page or whatever it is. I think this would be, would be the place to, to put that. Working out your salvation, of course, you know, has anything to do with believing the gospel and receiving eternal life. It is an experiential issue. So it is the active pursuit of obedience in the process of being experientially sanctified. Being experientially sanctified is the goal. Another way you could put it is being a good and faithful servant is the goal. Being glorified, not just in a resurrection body, but by receiving rewards and decorations and privileges. But it is a process. Is eternal salvation a process? No. Even though a lot of people say it is, it's not. It's very clear. Faith alone in Christ alone. Now, the word work out in the Greek is katergazomai, K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. It's a verb, the present middle imperative. Now I want I, I, I want you to note I bolded that last M. The P stands for present, the M stands for middle, the middle voice. We're right here. And this M right here stands for the imperative. Now, what's one thing that you can conclude already since that is in the imperative mood? One thing we can conclude is that if we're, we are a believer, then we have the capacity, well, I shouldn't say we have the capacity, we have the opportunity to obey this because God never gives us command without giving us everything necessary that we need in order to obey that command. That's one reason why the imperative mood is important. And it means to cause a state or condition to bring about, produce, or create. Cat er God's am I. And what is it that we are to create, cause a condition, or what are we to bring about? As we're going to see here, our salvation, but for our ears, if you're talking about this, if you say deliverance instead of salvation, you are on solid ground because salvation and deliverance are both in the realm of the words that are used to translate this. And they mean essentially the same thing you could say they're synonyms, but in real life, that's not the way we see it or the way other people see it. If you're talking about Scripture, you're talking about the Bible, and you use the word salvation, the great majority of people are going to think that you're talking about what happens when you believe the gospel. Nearly every time they see it, that's what they're going to think. And that's where they get mixed up. That is not what it is here. And then we have work out your. Your is hiatu, H-E-A-U-T-O-U. And it's a 
pronoun, genitive singular, masculine. And it means an indicator of identity with the person speaking or acting. To do, do, somewhat, do something for one's own accord. Do something of one, one's own accord. So this tells us that we are the one that must bring about the deliverance. The salvation. It says, work out your salvation. Now notice that nothing is said about working for your salvation. Those prepositions are very important. There's not one line in the Bible to support that. And when I say, it's that, it does not say work out for your salvation, for your deliverance. Again, we're in the 21st century speaking the English language. And working for something is different than work out something. This salvation or deliverance was both corporate and individual. It had two senses to it. Just think about it. Paul was in prison, so he could not deal with the disunity and schisms that had developed in the church. So the Philippian believers would have to work out their own deliverance concerning the church. We hadn't got to this yet. Yodia, Yodia, I think is how you pronounce it. There's two ladies that were fighting one another, one another verbally and that caused a schism. Remember in the first chapter how unity was so important? And it says that we are to consider others more important than ourselves and not just think about our problems, but think about other people's problems as well. That was setting up the climate or the attitude that he was wanting the Philippians to have because there was some disunity there. So easy for churches to have disunity. You can, all it takes is two people to have an argument, to have some kind of um, disharmony, and people start choosing sides, and that is the ruination of a church. So that is what he's talking about in a corporate sense. It's individual in the sense that God has given every believer a specific plan. You may have heard people say, God has a plan for your life. I don't say that. I try not to say that because it's so redundant. People have heard that and they tune out. You could call it a mission. I like that better because I don't hear people say that so often and they just don't turn you off because it's trite. God has given a mission to each believer and each believer's mission is distinct and specific. It's just for that particular believer and every believer is here on a mission that God has designed. So, this work, work out your deliverance is individual in the sense that God expects us to fulfill our mission, and that is working out our deliverance. He has given us the means to accomplish our mission, but it is up to us to work it out, or you could say, complete the mission. What I'm giving this to you is in different words, different ways of expressing it, and whatever resonates with you, that's you can, you can pick that up. You don't have to say, work out your own salvation, just because that's the, the phrase that the scriptures use. I'm going to show you that it's used in other scriptures using different words and different phrases, but it means exactly the same thing. And I'm giving it to you now in a general sense. Corporately, God will have a the believers in a church to work out their deliverance. If there's a problem, in this case, there was disunity. There were, they had broken up into schisms, into different uh, tribes, as it were. And he said, you have to work on that. 
He wasn't there to address it. So they had to work out deliverance from that. And here's the thing. It can't be worked out corporately until, first of all, it's worked out individually with each of the believers. It's when the believers are working out their deliverance by focusing on and using the assets that God has given us in order to fulfill their mission. Every time God gives us a command, He gives us the means to accomplish it. And our overall mission is the same. Believers have tremendous assets in order to fulfill their mission. But we live in a fallen world and we have the lies broadcast to us every single day on TV, on the radio, movies, newspapers, you name it, internet. So are y'all squared away on how it is corporate and how it is individual? There are a few verses that use a similar phrase as work out your salvation. So I'm going to give you some other scriptures using different words, different phrases, but meaning the same thing. First of all, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh. So you, we know this cleanse ourselves is rebound. And you'll notice that again in this verse, just like we've been studying in Genesis chapter 14, that it was the promises of God that prompted and motivated Abram to act, to behave in a certain manner. And we see that throughout the Bible. If you start looking at it, everything is based on promises, the promises of God. He's revealed these promises to us. Some promises are unconditional. God made four unconditional promises to Israel. They have not been completed yet. They haven't been fulfilled and won't until the second advent. But that motiv motivated millions of people to work out their own deliverance, to fulfill their mission because they believed the promise. And of course there's hundreds of promises that we can go to that have already been fulfilled also. That's one reason prophecy is such a strong argument that the Bible is God's Word. So therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, rebound, and rebound means to acknowledge your sins privately to God the Father. You just name them. You take responsibility for them when you name them. And when you do that, you have demonstrated the humility that is necessary. This is what God wants us to do. Because he makes war against the arrogant and gives grace to the humble. And when we acknowledge our sins, that sin has already been paid for. We're not judged for it. But when we acknowledge it, we demonstrate the humility. And then we are back in favor with God again. And then it says, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh. Now, you can, if you're, you might want to go there because this sounds a little, a little, uh, what would I say, confusing if you don't have some of these things filled in. We understand that therefore having these promises, let us cleanse ourselves, rebound from all defilement of the flesh. The flesh is associated with the old sin nature, which every person born uh, has an old sin nature. But then it says, and spirit. Where would we have to rebound uh, when, with regards to spirit? It's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. It's talking about negative volition. You can have a negative spirit. You could also, instead of saying and spirit, you could say a bad attitude. Bad attitude and negative volition are essentially the same. And then here's the word, here's the phrase that I'm saying is tantamount to the same thing as we have in our verse. Work out your salvation. Here it says, perfecting holiness. Perfecting 
holiness. In other words, what this means, to perfect means to finish or complete experiential righteousness. Experiential righteousness. As God expects us to be righteous. We have His imputed righteousness, uh, His, His imputed righteousness, and that is positional. It is permanent. Nothing can change, can, can, uh, can change that. But the, but that's not what is the context of this verse. It's experiential righteousness. In other words, as we go through time, as we live out the rest of our lives, we want to strive to experientially be righteous. Not just have the righteousness of God, which is already done. We, we understand that. But since we're still alive, God expects us to fulfill our mission. And fulfilling our mission, working out our deliverance, requires us to be righteous in the experiences we have in time. That's why it's called experiential righteousness. In our experiences, as we live this life, we want it to be righteous. And that's another way of saying, work out your salvation. And then it says, in the fear of God. Now we're in... 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, and Philippians 2, 12, at the end of it, it says, with fear and trembling. Look what we have here, in the fear of God. Can you see how this verse is similar to Philippians 2, 12, the verse that we're looking at? And it has the same or very similar wording, perfecting holiness is tantamount to working out your deliverance. It is fulfilling your mission. One of the wonderful things about being a Christian is the knowledge that God has a plan for our lives. It's not willy-nilly, as you would think. Uh, not you, but a lot of people think, well, it's just a crapshoot. Uh, who knows what's going to happen? It's just, there's nobody behind it. It's just, you could have bad luck or you could have good luck. It's all about luck. Well, that's human viewpoint. The Bible says otherwise. So God has a plan for our lives and will help us work it out for His glory. That's what this is talking about. When it says work out your deliverance, it's working out God's plan for His glory. That's what that verse is about. Now, I want you to turn to in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. <clears throat> you don't have to go far, do you? <laughs> Just the previous book. You all know, I hope you know, Ephesians 2, chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. It's a done deal. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the what? Gift, Gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, in those two verses... It's, it's saying that eternal salvation is by grace. It's not by works. But then when we get to verse 10, which he quoted in the, in the quote that I just gave you. By the way, that's from Warren Wiersbe, the Bible exposition commentary. He, quote, he has in there, God has a plan for our lives, Ephesians 2.10. Now look at Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Do you see just how in one verse, those two verses combined say that eternal salvation is not of works lest anybody should boast. And we understand that. That's positional. But in the very next verse, we have something that is experiential. Now it's saying that we're created for good works. And this is a good one for you to show people to say, look, we're not saying when their eternal salvation is not of good works. We're not saying that we don't, we're not commanded to do good works. 
It's just that they have nothing to do with being eternally saved. We need to be have another kind of deliverance that does that includes good works. So he said, created in Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You understand this is all experiential. And it's about a plan. What have I been talking about in these verses here? God's plan. Work out your deliverance. That means that you have to put forth effort if you're going to fulfill God's mission for you on earth, this plan. And so I thought this was relevant. You have in two verses talking about it's not of works, Verse 8 and 9 are clearly positional. Verse 10 is clearly experiential. And so if people have a hard time when you say, look, works have nothing whatsoever to do with eternal salvation. Sometimes they may have a hard time understanding that because their entire life they're encouraged to do good works, do good works for God. But the good works come after salvation. It doesn't have anything to do with salvation. We're created unto good works, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them is similar to working out your deliverance or your salvation. You understand that? Different kind of work there. I just thought I'd point that out because it's important. So if anybody says, well, you're, you're saying that I don't, I can live the rest of my life and never do a good deed and still go to heaven? Well, you, the answer to that is yes. But you may want to add that you don't ever have to do anything of any kind of work for eternal salvation because Jesus Christ was the only one that could provide a good work which was unique, his atoning sacrifice for us on the cross, that's been done, and that's eternal. But that doesn't mean that after you're saved that you can just raise hell and live like, like what is that? Uh, uh, that that uh, it's not a club, it's a gang, of the hell's angels. You, 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 could, you could become a believer and then get into the hell's angels and go through all the licentiousness and and crime or whatever else they do. But that's not what God's plan is. And if you do not work out your deliverance, if you don't perfect holiness in yourselves, then you should be afraid. There should be fear and trembling if you don't do that. A lot of times this is left out. Are you all understanding? Am I giving it? Okay. Good. Now, no believer can perfect holiness. See up here in our 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. First, we cleanse ourselves in order to be able to have access to the omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit. And then we perfect holiness or work out our salvation is a similar thing. Fulfill our mission. So here's, here's the point. No believer can perfect holiness, work out one's deliverance, without being humble and having fear and respect for God. If you're arrogant, forget it. You're not going to fulfill your mission. And if you're trying to fulfill your mission by doing goods, doing good deeds in your own power, that's an insult as well. It's, it's, it's got to be on God's power. Jesus Christ demonstrated how to perfect holiness through his life lived through the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit. He demonstrated how one perfects holiness. See, we just had here perfecting holiness. That is a participle, perfecting, but it is something that is expected of us. And what, what I'm saying here in this note is Jesus Christ perfected holiness in and of himself with all the sufferings and all the testings and all the adversity that he faced. He perfected holiness. He was holy. 
And he demonstrated, let me finish this sentence and it'll show. His life lived through the empowering ministry of the Holy Spirit. He demonstrated to the universe that by depending upon the power of the Holy Spirit and not his omnipotence to face all the exigencies of life, all the, all the testing and, and troubles and woes and pain and suffering and all this, he proved that it worked. He demonstrated that it worked. So it is available to every church age believer. Some use it and some don't. You cannot fulfill God's mission for you apart from being filled with the Holy Spirit. How many believers out there don't know how to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Don't know anything about it. So many of them now try to go back to the Mosaic Law and be as good as they can. And I'm not, con I'm not belittling them or condemning them. Really, I feel sorry for them. And why is it they're not doing it? Because they've never been taught. They don't know how to access the power of the Holy Spirit by simply naming their sins to God. Then they're in spiritual the spirituality and then they can fulfill your mission. You can't fulfill your mission on your own power, no matter how hard you try. Perfecting holiness and working out your salvation do not refer to good deeds. You can't go out there and fulfill your mission by doing good deeds. And that's what that's what most people are trying. I would I would dare say that the great majority, maybe even up into the ninety percentile of Christians that you know, or maybe even, of course the ones you don't know as well, are trying to fulfill their mission by being as good as people as they can be. But they know nothing about the spiritual life. They have no idea about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, those are all completely foreign to them. They don't know anything about them. And when they sin, which we all inevitably do, then they feel bad about it and they try to make it up to God by doing, doing more good deeds, which are human good, which He rejects anyway. So, perfecting holiness, working out your salvation, doesn't refer to good deeds. It refers to learning truth from the Word of God and then applying it to your circumstances. That is how you work out your salvation, how you work out your deliverance, how you perfect your holiness, perfect holiness. You see, that's spiritual. And then, once you have done that, once you, are lear you have learned doctrine, and you are applying it to your circumstances, you know what you're doing? You're working out your deliverance. You're perfecting holiness. But who gets the credit? God does. Who's the one who showed you what the truth is? In other words, it's God's Word that enables us to fulfill our mission and us being able to understand it is grace, isn't it? The fact that we have His Word is grace. Understanding it is grace. All the things that we need in order to take in His Word, our health, our transportation, whatever it may be, that's all grace. And when we apply those doctrines to our circumstances, who's fighting for us? He is. It's the Holy Spirit's power that is enabling, to do, uh, enabling us to do this. So that's grace as well. Learning truth from the Word of God and then applying that truth to your circumstances. That's what this life is about. It's not about doing People out there running around hustling, doing everything they can. And what they're doing isn't bad. It just has nothing to do with the spiritual life. And what God is interested in is our spiritual life. 
Are y'all ready for Hebrews 2.10? Y'all got any questions? Okay. Hebrews 2.10. I want y'all to turn to it. See, when I put things in parentheses, it's helpful. But I want y'all to be able to, to be able to look at these verses and understand what is in the parentheses when it isn't given, when I haven't given it to you. Because when you see enough of these verses and you start thinking in a mode that is not eternal salvation, it is experiential then a lot of things are going to come to light that otherwise would not. Hebrews 2.10 For it was fitting for Him, and I have there GTF, which is God the Father. For it was fitting for Him, God the Father, for whom all things, for whom are all things, and I have there in parentheses the source. He is the source of all things. God the Father. And through whom all things are all things. And through whom are all things. He is the agent. Through whom all things came into being. Jesus Christ is the means that he used to bring all things into being. Because all things were created by Christ in heaven and earth. Nothing was created that, nothing exists that is created that wasn't created by Him. But, Jesus, but God the Father is the agent and He is the source of all things. In bringing many sons, and this is referring to church age believers. To to bring many sons, church age believers, to glory. And I have in parentheses there, glorification. Now I'm going to give you a little something that is explanatory here. All believers will receive a resurrection body. Some will call it a glorified body. And that's okay, that's fine. All believers get a glorified body, but not all believers are going to have glorification. Because that comes with crowns and rewards and decorations. So God the Father is the source of all things through whom all things come in bringing many sons to glory. So what is, what is, what is the purpose of this? It is God the Father who brings Many sons to glorification. God's goal for every believer is to bring them to the point of glorification. But they cannot be glorified apart from inculcating, learning, and growing in His Word. It would be like if you had a team. Let's say you had a baseball team. And there are going to be some who are going to shine. They're going to be stars. You might be say you might say they're going to be glorified. And those are the ones who know what's going on, that are humble. There, there are going to be some though that don't know anything about it. And so we'll put them out in right field and let them wander around. They're on the team. They're glorified in the sense they have a uniform, which would be tantamount to a resurrection body. But they're not going to have any any special things on their uniform, any uh, insignia or anything, because they were glorified. You understand what I'm trying to say? So that's the goal. God doesn't just want us to believe the gospel and then just forget Him. Now, then it's, I'll read it again. For it was fitting for him for whom all things, and through whom all things, in bringing many sons to glory, which is glorification, 
to perfect, that means to bring to completion their author. He's not talking about bringing us to completion. He's talking about bringing the author of their salvation. Now the author, you'll notice I, what I have in parentheses here, all starts with capital letters. The pioneer, the leader, the champion is all tantamount to the author, which is Jesus Christ. Now the goal is to bring many sons to glory. doesn't mean just to get to heaven. It's talking about glorification there. And in order to do that, God the Father had to perfect the author that is Jesus Christ, the champion of their, again, church age believers, and here, then it says salvation. Now I would dare say that 99 out of 100 people would look at that and think this is talking about eternal salvation. And then it says, but I, you see in parentheses, I have deliverance. To perfect the author, the pioneer, the champion of their deliverance through sufferings, and I have in parentheses there, adversities he faced not limited to the cross. Now one way that you can tell that this is this salvation is experiential and not salvific is because sufferings is plural. Did Christ have to continue to suffer after he went to the cross? No. Did any of his sufferings other than when he had our penalty which is spiritual death separation from God the Father Anything that else that he suffered, would that contribute to that? Did he, is there something else that he needed to do in his sufferings other than just ex, to experience our spiritual death that he took on himself? Was that enough? Yes. I hope you all are thinking that. Absolutely. Absolutely. All the other sufferings that he experienced were important. I'm not saying they weren't important. But it was that singular, when he died spiritually on the cross, that is what gave us what we needed was a substitute and that is directly related to eternal life and, and positional salvation. Y'all understand that? So this being in the plural means that it can't be referring to what he did on the cross for the salvation. It may include it, maybe, but that's, it's not, that's not what at stake. He, Jesus Christ had to be perfected. The author of their church age believers deliverance. He had to leave a, per, a perfect life and go through all these sufferings in order to prove to us and deliver us from our troubles and woes and aggravation. And the, the way he did it was through relying on the Holy Spirit. And then he bequeathed that to us. Now this isn't an easy verse, but it really should have a light bulb come on when you understand it. So God the Father was bringing many, uh, many sons to glory, meaning for, to glorification. And he had to perfect the author of their salvation, of their deliverance first, through many sufferings. Because it's through the many sufferings that God demonstrated through Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit would be powerful enough, and that is the means for all the believers yet to come to work out their deliverance to perfect their holiness. Are you getting it? Okay. Here's a quote from uh, Dr. Robert Dean, Robbie Dean, in uh, New Testament, this were number 19. He says the following. He, referring God to God, is preparing us for glory. He is preparing us 
for eternity. That preparation is of such a complex nature that in order to give us what we needed, he had to send his son not only in terms of sending him to the cross, but in terms of pioneering this tremendous spiritual life. He pioneered life so that we could, in turn, follow. Follow Christ. Do you ever hear this talked about? It's as if it doesn't even exist. The unique spiritual life of church age believers is what, is what this is talking about. And very few, very few, would even, could keep up with what I've given so far. And the fact that you are, I hope you are, I ask you if you had any questions, if you're not, I'll give it another shot. But you see how the more you learn about God, the more appreciation you have. The sufferings that Jesus Christ went through, sufferings, thousands, maybe millions of times of suffering, every day he was on the grill. He was being tested. In order to prove that what he bequeathed to us is unquestionably effective. And God is glorified when we use that. And it's called working out your deliverance, perfecting your holiness, and we'll see a couple more as we go. I thought that was a good quote. He didn't send his son just to go to the cross, but in pioneering this tremendous spiritual life. He pioneered that life that we could in turn follow. Follow that. And you talk to people... People that have been going to churches all their life and you ask, can you tell me what the spiritual life for believers in our time? I wouldn't say church age. I mean, you may, but just what is, what is the spiritual life? And get ready. You're going to think you're living, you're, you're watching Outer Limits. <laughs> you use that word spiritual, there's no telling them where they're going to go. But I'm giving you the biblical sense of it. <clears throat> okay, now turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. That's not far, far we were in verse 10. <laughs> Hebrews 2, 2. For if... And that's a first class conditional clause, meaning it is true. You could say, for since the word spoken through angels proved unalterable, no, there was, the word spoken to angels was proved unalterable. What does that mean? Couldn't be changed. And every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty. Now I want to point something out. Did you notice all that is in the past tense? I have ED on receive read just for me to remind me to re <laughs> that you see and you notice that that is all in the past tense. You understand that? But now look at the change. How will we? What is that? Future tense, isn't it? How will we escape if we Neglect so great a salvation. Now, that word could just as easily be translated if we neglect so great a deliverance. Now, my question is, is this word salvific, salvation that I have in red there? No, it's not. But let's, let's see why. First of all, you notice how I have we and if we? The writer of Hebrews himself is including himself in this. If we neglect so great a salvation. So if this was talking about salvation, if this was salvific, it would mean the writers of Hebrew would be anticipating that they wouldn't escape Something, and the something is so great a salvation. They, in other words, they wouldn't escape hell. You understand that? If it was salvific, that, that would have to be what it's talking about here. 
But of course, it's not talking about hell, is it? But so many people, if we neglect so great a salvation, the antinomians, I mean the, uh, it's not the antinomians, the um, Calvinists. Calvinists and the, um, what's the other one? Starts with an I. Uh, it's after uh, named after um, well I can't think of it right now I know there's probably people online screaming it ah, this is it I'll, I'll think about it in a moment anyway um, so we're talking about believers here now if we in the Greek is a maleo a m e l e o it's a participle aorist active participle and it means to have no care for, to neglect, be unconcerned about something or someone. That's what if we means. Amaleo. Amaleo. So if we... how See, it's talking about at the first of this verse about angels. The word was given to them and it was unalterable and every transgression... And disobedience received a just penalty. So do you understand? This is a warning. This is a warning to us. He says, if that's true, if, if, if they were disobedient and what was told to them, if they disobeyed, this is going to happen. It was unalterable. They would suffer it. If that's true for the Old Testament saints, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Now, if, it's, if you think about that in terms of deliverance, if you think of it in terms of not working out your deliverance, if you think of it in terms as perfecting your holiness, if you think of it of not fulfilling God's plan, if you think of it not fulfilling your mission, then it comes into, it comes into focus, doesn't it? It's a, it's a warning. If we have this attitude, if we hear the, the words here, to have no care for, to neglect, be unconcerned about something or some way. Another way of saying this is if we don't give a hoot about doctrine, if we don't give a hoot about God, if we don't care or don't even know about fulfilling our mission, if we don't understand or think about or even care about not working out our deliverance, it says, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to escape if we neglect this thing? Well, what I've been talking about, what God bequeathed to us, that Jesus Christ had demonstrated, perfected, and says, yes, here's yours. It's yours. I have already given you the prototype. It's perfect. Now you use it. And if you say, I don't care about that. If you have the idea of not caring, neglecting, being unconcerned about it, how are we going to escape punishment? That's the question. But what is the punishment? Is the punishment hell? Hell no. That would be positional, wouldn't it? Do you understand how people get just completely derailed when they see that word salvation that colors everything else and they think, oh, this is talking about eternal salvation. And if that's true, then we can neglect something. If we neglect something that is positional, then we had to do something in order to get it. you understand? There's something other than faith alone. There's something else that we have to do. This verse has nothing to do with believing the gospel and receiving eternal, uh, eternal salvation. It is a warning to church age believers that there is a just penalty or punishment for us if we neglect or ignore the deliverance God has provided for us. And that would be the implementation of spiritual dynamics, the spiritual life, all the things that God has given, and they're unique to us, just to church age believers. So it's a warning that there is a punishment for us if we neglect or ignore the deliverance God provided for us, the spiritual dynamics, which defeats the world, the flesh, and the devil. He's given us everything that we need to defeat these things 
that are attacking us continually. And people say, oh, well, everything's gone to hell in a handbasket. Uh, uh, God doesn't care about me. I don't think there's a God. If He did, I pray to Him, nothing happens. And when they pray to Him, they don't, they don't even know that, first of all, they should acknowledge their sins. And a lot of times they're not even, they'll, they'll pray to Jesus Christ. Some people pray to Mary. I mean, it's all over the place. So He has bequeathed this to us. And there is a punishment to ignore it or to not care about it. How many people are out there? I know some people say, well, you know, I'm a believer. I'm going to heaven. That's all that matters. Why do I need to bother myself with really uh, spending all this time in the Bible? Because I won't be in heaven. Heaven's a wonderful place and that's all that matters. You know how many people think that way? And those are the ones that understand eternal security. The ones that don't even understand that are in worse shape. They're dreading every day. Oh, I did something today. I'm probably going to hell now. This is good right here. Inasmuch as under the old covenant, which was instituted through angelic ministration, Galatians 3.19, that means that God used angels to get the gospel to Old Testament saints. There were severe penalties for infractions of its demands. The readers could not suppose there would be no penalties for infractions against the new covenant. Now, the, he's saying the new covenant here. I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily uh, use that term. But what he's essentially saying is in the Old Testament, they had the Mosaic Law, and if they were in fractions, boy, they got it. I mean, they, there was no, no leniency. There were severe penalties. And so if it's that way in the Old Testament, what would think people... What would make people think that there's no penalties for infractions now that we are under a higher law? We're not under the Mosaic law. And people say, oh, well, you can do anything you want. No, now we are under a higher law than they lived under. And if they receive tremendous penalty and discipline when they didn't follow the Mosaic law, what is it going to be like for church age believers who have a higher law and they had this phenomenal spiritual life that was tested and given to, to them? They say, I don't care about that. I've got better things to do. What's on TV tonight? They're not learning these things that you are. Do you think that they're going to get off scot free? Of course not. And they don't even know. They don't even know what's happening. And how many churches are teaching this? How many churches are giving, are drilling down to show what these verses actually mean? And how many people even care? In fact, I would say that if churches in mass started teaching the, to the extent and depth that I am with y'all, church attendance would plummet. Because that's not why they're going there. They go in there to feel good about themselves. But when it comes to the real trials of life, they have nothing. They are completely undone because they have no spiritual dynamic. They don't even know what they are. They don't have a clue. And we wonder why our society is in the dregs. And God is looking for those believers like yourself that want to be good and faithful servants. And what, what, what he outlines in his word right here is this is how you do it. And you can't do it if you're not consistently taking in the word. And the more you delve, the more you learn. I didn't, I didn't realize until I was in Philippians here how important this is. And to be able to articulate it to this degree on verses like this, it comes alive. But that's why I laid the foundation of the framework to begin with of what's positional and what's experiential because if you don't un understand that, you're going to think every time you see salvation, it's salvific and you don't even know squat. You're going to be totally confused. 
This is a real good verse here, but we're going to have to wait till next time. Hebrews 12.25. I can tell you already, again, it's saying, if we... And the writer... How many of you think that the possibility of the writer of Hebrews wasn't saved? Huh? So if he's including himself in this, he can't be talking about losing eternal salvation, can he? Or that this is written to unbelievers that are trying, they're trying to get saved. That's balderdash. The New Testament is loaded. It is just concentrated with verses that are warning church age believers of what is at stake to wake them up, to use the spiritual life. Learn it and use it. And we should have confidence because it's the one that Christ used. We're out of time, so we'll pick this up next time. But just a second, just a second. Hold, hold, hold on. They're going to be uh, fussing at me because I didn't repeat it, and I can't repeat all that. So, go ahead. Wait, wait. wait. What? Okay, go ahead. Uh, this lesson tonight makes me realize what the greatest of all the grace teachers in, in the New Testament. In the New Testament, they, uh, Paul said, I have fought a good fight, I have uh, run a good race, and I have kept the faith. And this is what keeping the faith means. It's in phase two. Mm -hmm. You don't just quit because you got saved. You just now got in the race. You're supposed to run the race. <laughs> you just now got in the race. <laughs> and so this is where we fail, and we're, and people that don't see this, and I've just got a little glimpse of it, but it's so much appreciated that there's more. And that's where and pa Paul said, there's therefore laid up for me a crown of righteousness. There's more than salvation. And this is so important, and I thank you for presenting this tonight. Well, it's, I appreciate that, but it, it's not easy. And this group is to be commended in whoever is watching this or will watch it, because this doesn't appeal to most people. They want the frills. They want the bands and the emotions. But this gives me a sense of appreciation that I didn't have before, and, and think only a fool would not employ this into their own life because this is what God expects of us. Okay, let's close. Father, thank you for this time that we can learn these phenomenal things about the plan that you have in eternity past. For each one of us, you had a specific plan. And you give us the means to fulfill it. The revelation, and then understanding, being able to understand that spiritual phenomenon then the Holy Spirit coming in and, and helping us to not fight in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm and see your faithfulness. That's just so tremendous for us. This is the only way that we can fulfill our plan. It's a plan in which you get the glory and we get the blessing, and it's phenomenal. So help us to think more about this. Maybe go over these same verses and meditate on it. Maybe have a question, whatever it is. Because it's too important just to hit, hit it one time and then uh, go on to something else. This is what our life should be about. And we pray that you will help us make it that way. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.